Good evening, everybody. We are very much honored by the visit of uh, Professor Garabos. Professor Garabos is a renowned, well-known scholar from Cambridge. And I know his name for a long time. But today, I met a real person <laughs> face to face only at last. <laughs> and he's renowned for his study of the uh, you know, Donghuang manuscripts and also the Tonggut manuscripts. Zhonghui is the setting there. The Tonggut manuscripts is very difficult to read. This is uh, perhaps only a very few scholars who can read the Tonggut manuscripts. Because the Tonggut manuscript, it's, a, it's a some kind of script, you know, today very, very rare. Uh, and uh, Professor Galabas is a very productive scholar and writer, produced many books and articles. His latest book is on the Donghua manuscript culture, end of the first millennial, and including many other papers. And today, his talk will be on the Siyama Jataka. And Siyama Jataka, as a lot of my students said in this room, they know that it's one of the very popular Buddhist text teaching filial piety. Uh, of course, filial piety later on became very popular with another book, another text. But Sama Jataka plays a very important role. So today, Professor Galabors will discuss the development and also the ideas and how this text developed within the Chinese Buddhist tradition. So let's welcome Professor Galabos. So thank you. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's a privilege to be here, and I'm very grateful to uh, Professor Guang for his very kind introduction, and also for uh, the Center for Buddhist Studies, for uh, Professor Halkias, and everybody who was involved in organizing this. This is a project that I've been working on for quite a while, um, probably started about eight years ago. and. Since then, and it still hasn't come out. Uh, it's going to be a long article, but um, over the course of the, these many years, I've been also dealing with some personal issues with, where, uh, which connected me closer to this, uh, to this Jataka. And so I wanted to share uh, my research today. So, and I'm not looking at it, I'm not coming at it from the perspective of Buddhist studies. Actually, I'm looking at it from the Chinese perspective, um, from the Chinese concept of filial piety. So we know this concept um, developed in uh, China fairly early, and then already in the early medieval period, you have um, these stories of filial uh, children. And uh, the stories appear um, written down in texts, but these texts didn't survive actually. So the earliest editions of these texts actually uh, begin from the 9th and 10th century. But we know of these texts uh, from other sources. Uh, they, they, be they became transmitted texts, but they didn't survive as, ma as manuscripts. What did survive, however, um, is this, uh, these depictions of these stories in funeral art. Uh, typically. Here, for example, we see, I have a wonderful pointer. Um, here we see this uh, story of Guo Jiu. And Guo Jiu is here, he's digging, um, he's digging a hole to bury his son. So you can see the son. And if you're kind of, if you grew up in China, you probably know the story, uh, which is that Guo Jiu and his wife, they were quite poor, and they were also supporting his mother. And then when they had a baby, they realized that because of the baby, they will, they will have much less resources to support the old mother. So they, they thought about it, what to do, and then they decided to, to bury the son, to, to kill their child. And from a Western perspective, of course, this sounds like a heinous crime, crime. But 
from within their own mindset, this was kind of making the ultimate sacrifice, right? So this is doing something nobody else would be willing to do. And for that reason, um, this becomes the story. And as you can see, actually, there are three shorter inscriptions here. So these three groups of inscriptions here um, are quite interesting because they identify the key um, participants in the story. Because what happens is that uh, when Guoju digs a hole in the ground to bury his son, he actually finds a pot of gold. And he, fi he finds a little notice which says, you've demonstrated your filiality and this pot of gold is for you, so you will not have this problem anymore. And so the child is saved and everybody is happy. And basically, it's really interesting, again, from a modern perspective, that the, the actors here are Guo Ju, the pot of gold, and his wife. So the child is not an actor. Um, the child is an excuse, or rather the child is the, the premise uh, in this story. Something also quite interesting, uh, that this story of Goju becomes very, very popular. Uh, here's another depiction of it. So Goju is digging, um, digging in the ground, digging a hole, and then he finds the pot of gold. And I don't know if people are, have a, who have a different background, maybe they, they notice that this story is actually very similar to the story of the binding of Isaac. So Abraham is told by God to sacrifice his son, and at the very end, when he's about to do that, when he's about to cut his uh, son's throat on the altar, um, an angel comes and tells him, you don't need to do that. You've demonstrated your filial filiality to God, and we have someone else uh, to, to sacrifice. And indeed, there is a, there's a ram, there's a sheep there. And so they sacrifice the sheep. So in these two, these stories are parallel, but in one case, in the Chinese case, this uh, ultimate love and devotion is not to God, but to a parent. And that's actually really, really interesting. But, I, but other than that, the two stories are remarkably parallel. Here's another story uh, of Emperor Shun. Uh, Emperor Shun is one of the Chinese cultural heroes. And he's the one who takes over the, uh, the governing of the empire or the, the world, basically, at that time um, from Emperor Yao, from the mythical Emperor Yao. But that's sort of the early Chinese story about him. And from about the Han Dynasty, there's another story that merges with this, is that he's a filial son. And so he has these two people, actually three people, in this case, you have, um, there's his father, who is called Guso, and his brother, uh, stepbrother, uh, who try to kill him. And the third person who tries to kill him is his stepmother. So his whole family, basically, constantly trying to kill him. And he always escapes, miraculously, and he, he always loves them. He continues to love them. So this devotion to to your family, to your parents, despite anything that they're trying to do to you, is kind of the moral of the story. So this is the background against which I'm looking at uh, the story of the Shyama Jataka. And for the story itself, we'll talk about the, the plot of the story in a second, but for the story itself, we have to go back to the, to the Ramayana, uh, which is a an Indian text, very early, written in Sanskrit, and it's, um, it has different layers, of course, but it was definitely written before the third century uh, BC, and larger parts of it well before that. So in this story, uh, in this uh, collection of stories, actually, uh, there is one where, which talks about um, something that later becomes the, uh, the Shyama Jataka. So this is the story of King Dasharatha um, going on a hunt, and then he hears an elephant somewhere, but he doesn't see it well. Nevertheless, he takes an arrow and he shoots at the elephant. 
And what happens is he hits uh, this young boy, and the young boy dies. But before he dies, uh, he says that, oh, with one arrow you killed three people. And the king goes over there and tries to find out what happened, who is talking. Then he realizes that there is this a young boy um, there on the ground. And uh, the, the boy talks about this uh, to the king, tells him that now that he's dying, he's, he's actually saying that one arrow killed three people because it's not only him, it's also his, uh, his parents who will die. Because his parents are blind and they live in a forest and he uh, takes care of them. So he brings water to them every day from the river and without him they die. And then there is a longer discussion. Uh, basically he dies, then the, the king goes to, see, uh, to find the parents and brings them over there. And nobody blames the king. They, they realize that this is, a, this is an accident. Uh, nevertheless, uh, the, the father puts a curse on the king and says that he will suffer a similar fate. And indeed later, uh, the king's son also dies. And that's when he realizes, he kind of it clicks for him, he realizes that, okay, this is because of the curse. And indeed today, I suffered the same fortune. So this story in the Ramayana is very, very popular in, not only in India, but all over Southeast Asia and, and South Asia. So it becomes used and the entire Ramayana is, of course, very, very popular. So these stories enter the popular tradition and they continue to this very day. And so you have, uh, for example, a later story. Uh, it turns into this person, um, this boy who is not named in the story, turns into this person called Shravan or Shravana. And this is the earliest European depiction of this story. And this depiction shows him taking care of his parents. So he's carrying his parents around. And actually, if you look at the previous image, you can see that even in the Ramayana, these kind of, um, this bamboo pole with two seats on which he carries his parents is there. This is an indication that he's, he's a filial son. He's taking care of his parents. Of course, this, this requires enormous strength and devotion, you have to be very willing to do this, uh, to put the effort in. And probably that's why this particular act of carrying two people, two parents, becomes uh, the most important kind of the iconic representation of this story. And as you can see, this is from a French travelogue. Um, the, the voyages and observations of Sir um, de la Boulaye de Gouze, and it was published in the 17th century, mid 17th century, so it's, it's quite early. So it's interesting that this kind of an offshoot of, this, of the Shama Jataka actually appears in a quite early print uh, in Europe. But this story continues, and even today, um, if you look it up on the internet or anywhere, you would find probably hundreds of different books and YouTube videos about this. This is part of everyday culture today. And the boy is called Shravan Kumar. So Kumar means a child, a boy. And he's one of these, in India, he's one of, in Hindi culture, he's one of these um, models of how to behave well. And obviously the point of the story is filial piety, how, that you have to take care of your parents. So when we talk about filial piety, we cannot always think that it's a Chinese phenomenon only. So the Chinese people are, uh, or the Chinese culture is special in this respect because in many other cultures, including um, uh, on the Indian subcontinent, many other cultures have a, a similar, uh, similar values. And then the story enters into the Buddhist um, kind of the Buddh into Buddhist literature. So one of the most complete early uh, descriptions of the story appears in this text, the Mahavastu, uh, which is a collection of Jataka stories, and it dates to the second, uh, from the second to the fourth century. 
and it describes the story in quite a detail. There is an English translation that came out in 1949 to 1952, and I just introduce here a little bit of that uh, because I think it's interesting, and where it talks about the boy growing up in the forest with his parents. His parents are blind in the story, always, and he grows up with them. And the story says, and that hermitage, is the hermitage where they lived, was grazed by thousands of wild beasts and birds. When the young of the wild animals sucked their mother's teeth, they did shamaka likewise. Then did Shyamaka likewise suck a wild animal's teeth. Whatever, the, whatever animal he associated with, that animal would suckle him like her own offspring. And then the story goes on actually to describe this life, his early life in the forest. And there's a great emphasis on him being friends with all the animals around him. So he plays with them, he sleeps with them, they come into their home. It's, it's a very symbiotic relationship with, with the animals. But not only the animals, but the whole forest around them. And this theme of kind of making the forest, making the environment better, actually comes back in many other, shab many other Jataka stories. For example, the Vesantara Jataka, where they go to the uh, forest, and then the forest, which was a scary, wild forest before, it turns into this very pleasant uh, place because of the presence of the Bodhisattva. Now, Ulrike kindly brought to my attention that Shyamaka, or Shyama rather, uh, in, in Sanskrit means dark complexion. And actually this story in the Mahavastu explains that, that uh, he was called this because he had a dark complexion. So he was, he was not black, but he was a darker, um, dark, he had a darker skin. And that is a very, very interesting uh, motif because we remember that his parents are blind, right? And then his name in Chinese uh, will be, as we'll see in a minute, will be associated with, with looking, with, with the glimpse or a glance uh, or a wink. Um, and so this, this idea of the eye and one, like the darkness of the eye and the brightness of the eye is present in this story. And actually in this sense it parallels the story of Emperor Shun, Shunzi, uh, who was the, um, the filial son because his father was called Guso, which means blind man or blind old man. And his name, Shun, uh, okay now we don't write the Muzapal, the the I radical, but, but actually it meant that word, which means a glimpse or a blink. So both of them have these names, and there's a, there's a very clear parallel, which makes me think that um, when they were translating the story of, of Shyama into Chinese, they consciously chose a word um, that was kind of similar to uh, the story of Emperor Shun, to Shun's name. Because otherwise, of course, it, it doesn't make immediate sense, right? So the Sanskrit name is Shyama, it means dark, and then the Chinese main name means to look. It's, it doesn't fit, but if you have the parallel of Shun's story, then you understand that there is this uh, motif. And then in the Mahavastu, here's the, story, here's the part where he, he's shot by the king. So he, the arrow hit him, and then Shyama, the seer, put down his pitcher on the riverbank and cried piteously. Deers and boars, he said, are slain for their flesh, lions, tigers, and leopards for their skins, yaks for their bushy tails, elephants for their tusks, and partridges and pheasants are killed to provide delicacies. But as for me, no one can be made, uh, no use can be made of my flesh, nor of my skin, hair, and teeth. For what purpose then are we three, inoffensive, innocent, and guiltless as we are, thus killed by one arrow? Ah, what blazing injustice. 
So you can see that the, this idea of being killed, three people being killed by one arrow, is very persistent in the different versions of the story. And also this, this lament about being killed unjustly and for no particular purpose compared to animals who are killed for their tusks or their, their feathers or something like that. Um, this is also very persistent. So it comes back in later Chinese versions of the story, which are quite distant in time and culturally also. So then you have basically the story becoming very, very popular. The Jataka becomes very popular in, in the Buddhist world. And so we have depictions of it in many, many places, including here, for example, there is a relief at Sanchi on stupa number one. And you can see, I think, you can see the king holding a, um, an arrow and then uh, probably Shama holding a pitcher uh, to carry uh, water for his uh, parents. So it is, yeah, and of course, most importantly, uh, we see him on the ground hit by an arrow. So it is, it appears in depictions. And of course, now we don't necessarily have the texts that go with these uh, depictions. So we, if we want to reconstruct the early versions of the story, then we have to take into account both art and also textual evidence, what, or what remains of textual evidence. Here's another story, another version, which is at the British Museum. This is from Gandhara. And here we see Shyama lying on the ground with a very thick arrow um, in his chest. And then yet another one um, here. He's lying here, and he's supported by his father and his mother. And this motif, again, as the, the old parents come and hold his body, is also very persistent. Because, but there are some variations. Uh, whether the father holds the head or the knees or the legs or the mother does that uh, changes from one story to the other. And it actually gives us a kind of a, um, a little bit of help when we try to trace the, uh, the transmission of the story, of the different versions. So in China, the, one of the earliest uh, full translations of the story, or, or rather elaborate descriptions of the story, is in the Liu Tu Ji Jing uh, by Kang Sen Hui, who was from Jiaozhi, so in, in northern Vietnam. He was a son of a, the translator was a son of a Sogdian merchant um, who went to Jiaozhi. And he translated this collection of stories um, in the third century, and uh, one of them is the story of Shanzi in it. And he uses this character to translate the word, or rather to, to transcribe the name. So it's a, it's a phonetic transcription, obviously, but at the same time, the meaning of the character probably also matters, as I uh, mentioned earlier. And then the, in this story, um, the plot is actually um, quite similar uh, to what we've seen in the Indic context. So they live in the forest. This bit is described as a very idyllic life, very happy life. Even though the parents are blind, um, Shan. So at this point, he's not called Shama, he's called Shan, right, using the Chinese name. So Shan is taking care of his parents, and he brings water to them. But when he does that, he goes to the river along with the deer. So there, there's a group of deer, and he hangs out with the deer, and he brings back water for his parents. But then comes the, the accident, the problem. So the, the king kills him with a poisonous arrow. And then the king goes and tells the parents. And of course, the parents are completely devastated. They're shocked. And they ask him to take them to, their, to the body. He, the king obliges. He takes them to the body. And then they, they hug their 
their son, and then they, they, they plead to heaven or to, to the gods, uh, saying that this son, their son, has been so filial. He's been a paragon of filial piety. So he doesn't deserve to die. He really should, be, should come back alive. And the gods listen. And Indra comes down from heaven. She uses a, um, or he, a, a magic potion, uh, pours it into Shan's mouth, and Shan resurrects. And the conclusion of the story is that because of the king's remorse, everybody in the realm starts to be uh, following the ten virtues and practicing filial piety. Again, a very happy end. Everything is perfect. There was a miracle. The miracle was triggered by this, the, the filial piety. So this, this motif of a miracle happening because somebody is very filial, very devoted to his parents, is, is consistent not only in the Indian stories, but also in all the Chinese versions. And also in all the Chinese versions of the, of the Chinese filial sons. But there are some other versions also, and I'm not going to look at all of them. Uh, I'm just going to mention this one, the Fu Shuo Pu Sa Shan Zi Jing, uh, which was translated in the Western Jin period. Um, and there, I'm, I'm only pointing out the bits that are different. So in this case, the story doesn't begin with them living in the forest. Instead, there is kind of like a cosmic look at all of this. So they, these old, this old couple wants to move into the mountains. They make this vow. And then the bodhisattva in heaven, he looks down and he thinks, this is a very kind of a good uh, couple. They're blind. They have no one to take care of them. And so he's he decides to be reborn as their son. And so he comes to live with them. And when he is, I think he's 10 years old, that's when they move into the forest. Uh, when, the, uh, when Shan is killed by the king, then the whole mountain changes. So the animals start to wail. And then there's a storm, violent storm. There's the... The trees are falling down. So the entire scene goes through this metamorphosis, um, which, is, which parallels what I said earlier, this idea that when the bodhisattva moves to a place and he lives there with his presence, he makes the whole place come alive and become very, very pleasant. So now he dies, the whole world around him just crumbles, basically. It becomes a very dark and scary place. And so the parents don't need to listen to the king. They, even though they're blind and they're away, they immediately recognize that what happened is that their, their son had suffered some sort of um, problem, probably died. And, so, and then the other differences is, are that when eventually he's resurrected, and in this case, it's not only Indra, but Brahma also comes down, and the four heavenly kings, so there's the whole delegation of gods who ascend uh, to the murder site, so to speak. Um, then, and he comes alive, then the parents also regain their eyesight. So this, this motif of, of, the, um, of the miracle is transferred also to the parents. So it's even, in a way, it's even a, a more like a better happy end than in the previous story. And then the whole mountain becomes even more pleasant. So it was very, very pleasant and a happy place to begin with. But now that he, the Bodhisattva came back alive, it becomes an even more paradise-like uh, scene. And the final, the kind of the moral of the story that Shanza tells the king not to kill animals anymore. And he asks everybody to follow filial piety. So there's this element of, of kind of stopping the killing, of, of not hunting anymore. So these are the, um, there are other, other versions of the story. Um, there, there's, a, there's a version translated by Sheng Jian, which is actually very similar to this. Um, but there are other mentions of the story.
but we're not going to look at all of these. I just wanted to also emphasize here that the story probably existed in many languages. Uh, because we see it in art throughout what is today Xinjiang and also Gandhara, uh, it appears in art, but it does not appear in text. So we don't have these texts. By comparison, the Vesantara Jataka or Vishwantara Jataka is found in Chinese, Tibetan, Sogdian, Old Uyghur, and Tokarian versions. So it's very, very interesting to have all these versions because they show us that there is, this region was of course not dominated by Chinese speaking people, but there were all sorts of people living there. And the, these versions are not always the same. So quite interestingly, for example, the, uh, the Japanese scholar Yoshida Yutaka has this uh, article about the Sogdian version of the, of the, of the Vesantara Jataka, where, uh, which is called something like, what happened to the legs of uh, Vesantara and of Sudana, uh, using the Chinese name, or uh, the Sogdians also borrowed the Chinese name. And so he talks about a completely different version of the Vesantara Jataka, which doesn't appear in the Chinese. Like, we don't have that. Interestingly, it appears in Mongolian in later period. So it's a really interesting web of interconnected text changing and also uh, being written in different languages. So if somebody wants to go after this, I think they, they would need to look at all these different languages and, and different layers, uh, chronological layers. It's very, very interesting. So we can guess that something like that would have been the case for the Shyama Jataka, but we don't really have evidence. It is mentioned in a Khotanese manuscript, um, this IOL Khot 6.5, so IOL in the office library, Khotanese manuscript 65. Um, it's mentioned only, so by name, the Jataka is mentioned um, in this text called Jataka Stava, but uh, the whole story is not there. But just by purely finding a reference to it, also actually tells us that this was something people knew about and the story circulated. Um, well, this story obviously in Khotan, so in the southern part of the Silk Road, in, in modern day Xinjiang. But there is actually, in art, it's a very popular story. So throughout Xinjiang and Gansu, you have many, many different places where the story appears. So this is one version on the ceiling um, in, a cave, in, in cave 114 in Kizil. So this is a site near Kucha. And um, this was unfortunately removed from Kucha and taken back to Berlin, where it fortunately survives today. Um, and I'm grateful to uh, a colleague, Lila Russell Smith, who uh, sent me a very good reproduction, a very good scan um, of this image. And it shows uh, how Shyama, I think we can use his uh, Indian name because it's not a Chinese context here. So he's drawing water for his parents from a pool. Uh, we don't really see the, the deer here, uh, but they're somewhere around, or the king thinks that he's uh, one of the deer, and uh, the king is shooting at him. And just below, uh, we move down a little bit, uh, you see this uh, mural where his, his blind parents are depicted in a cave. So both of them are ascetics. They're sitting there. You can obviously see that the father is very, very skinny because they follow the way. They follow the teaching. So this is in Kizil. You also have the story appearing in many places throughout China. I'm only going to show you a couple of examples. One is in the Yungang, uh, Yungang cave, caves. So here you see the king uh, shooting uh, Shyama again. There are some dogs, there is some deer over there. 
So again, this testifies to the popularity of the story around. And the interesting thing is that these, these depictions in art are not fully compatible with the textual versions that we have. So some of them contain elements that appear in none of the textual versions. So that tells us that there were many other versions, uh, some in different languages. For example, the one in, in Kizil um, would have probably been reliant on a different language. Or also that art also has its own channel of transmission, right? So it's not like every time you make a painting or you make a relief, you rely on a specific text but maybe you follow an iconographic convention. And so there are different channels of transmission. And there's a, a large wall painting on the ceiling of Cave 127 at Mai Ji Shan in Gansu province. It's not easy to see what's happening there, but it's a very, very large, well, relatively large image. So in Gansu, it was, it was very popular but nowhere more popular than at Dunhuang. So it appears in a number of caves, and I listed the caves here. So cave 10, 299, 301, 302, 470, and so on. Um, at least one of the murals from like cave 433 was cut out and taken to St. Petersburg, so you can see it in St. Petersburg today. It's no longer in Dunhuang. Again, this is a a practice that we definitely not condone today, uh, but it happened in the early 20th century. So there's some murals were removed, and some were destroyed by accident, actually. So this scene shows the king hunting for deer and probably um, shooting Shan in the process. And this is the kind of the main cave where the story is depicted most elaborately. And I wanted to talk about this cave in a little more detail because I want to show how it's, uh, the story is depicted, how the narrative sequence is depicted. And there's really a narrative sequence here. Um, so it begins, ooh, hold on. So it begins here. This is a different story. It begins here, and it goes around um, here. This is the, so we're coming down from here, and then go around, and then it continues on the, uh, on the right-hand side on the top. But actually, that's not the sequence in how it goes, because it's, it's a really interesting sequence how this happens, because there are scenes. So it's kind of like a cartoon. You have, it's a progression of uh, the story and you have different scenes. And so you have scene one here on the side and scene two, three, but then instead of continuing here, as you would assume probably that there is a continuity in this direction, instead of that, it jumps up um, to the side again, to the other side and goes four, five, and sort of the culmination of the story, the miracle, happens here. I think it's important that this is at the longest stretch and kind of in the center. Um, and basically the story from both directions channels into this final scene, which is, which is the scene of the miracle. So the miracle is kind of the, the punchline, the, the most important part in this story. And that's depicted um, in this way also. It's kind of, there's a culmination of visual uh, elements pointing towards this final scene. So this is what it looks like. And we're looking at this bit. So in this bit, we see, again, we see something that we don't see in any of the texts. What's happening here? So what's happening here is that the king in his palace is talking to his ministers or to his people and they're planning to go out on the hunt. We know this because the king is depicted in the other uh, scenes as well and this, this is who he is, so this is the king. This element of the story doesn't appear anywhere in any of the textual 
um, witnesses that we have. But again, it's quite interesting that it kind of begins almost like a secular story. It has this uh, political angle, so to speak. It begins with the king. So it's almost like the story is about the king. It's not about Shyama. Um, this is in a way similar to the story in the Ramayana, where the story was about the king, about the curse he receives. And we don't even learn the name of the boy. Uh, but this is already the Buddhist version, and it's quite interesting that this kind of uh, motif is preserved as well. And if we go to this wider bit, at the bottom we have several scenes there. Uh, we can see actually that the scenes are separated with these trees, and um, this, the trees used as separators in these Sequence of sequences of images is actually already um, seen in, in India in the same Jataka stories you have and even in Gandhara we saw even on these reliefs there are trees between the different scenes in the story quite interesting so to zoom in uh, this is what we see that the king travels with a probably a minister or servant somebody who travels with him and uh, they, they're looking at deer by the river and at this point nothing is happening yet and the the event the happening actually uh, occurs in the next slide or the next scene uh, when they shoot the king shoots at um, at, at this figure uh, who must be Shyama or it must be Shan and the, the deer are escaping and Shan just looks there almost like waiting for this arrow to hit him and this element of karma of kind of predestined fate uh, is almost always there in all of these stories this is why quite often he does not blame the king right so when the king said says oh this is a disaster you know what can I do what have I done then the dying boy quite often talks to the king and he says this is not your doing this is not your fault this is this was meant to happen so he does not blame them also the parents in the Ramayana um, knowing the Mahavastu they understand this but nevertheless even so they curse the king at the end so he's he's almost like ready to receive his fate here And, well, we don't see that he dies, uh, but then the next uh, scene four is that the king goes and talks to the parents. And the parents live in this remote, rather dark place in the forest, or maybe by now the forest is dark. And you can see that they have, um, I think this halo around them is actually the cave. So they're set against, each of them has a separate cave. But nevertheless, they illuminate the cave, so they're bright. Um, as opposed to the background of the king, which is completely dark, right? Um, so maybe there is kind of a visual signal or judgment there. And so the, the king tells the parents what happened, and then he leads the parents. And this leading the parents happens from the top going down so, and this is kind of, this is the final scene, but before the final, the penultimate scene is, is here, which is quite interesting because they, these two scenes kind of connect the, um, like they, 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 these figures, they seem to be looking at what's happening here. So they're not entirely separate scenes, although you have the trees, the customary trees, which signal that these are different scenes, different slides, so to speak. And then the resurrection itself is, is very glorious. I mean, the colors are dazzling, or there is there's quite a bit of effort um, that the painter went into to kind of signal this, this very, almost like a blazing um, descent of a deity, maybe Indra, um, who is going to heal the boy? 
and resurrect the boy. And this is where the parents are kind of supporting their boy and trying to, um, kind of, they're praying to, to the gods to resurrect him. So this is the Buddhist story in China. This, this is what happens. We have these relatively early translations of the story. And then we have lots of lots of uh, depictions in art, in caves, typically. So, well, that's where Buddhist art survives uh, from the pre-modern period. But there's quite a bit of it. So it was a very, very popular story. And probably it was much more popular in art rather than in text. So among the Dunhuang, in the Dunhuang corpus, um, I don't even remember if there is one copy of this sutra. There's a, it's not a common text, but it's a common image. Art is common. Instead, what happens, what we see in Dunhuang, is we see this story changing again and becoming one of the filial piety stories of the Chinese tradition, the, the Confucian story, so to speak, right? So this is, it distances itself from its Buddhist origin and becomes one of the paragons of filial piety, like Shun and uh, Guoju and, and other uh, people. And so in Tunhuang manuscripts from the 10th century or late 9th century, 10th century, you start having the story. So here you have uh, a version of the story from Dunhuang. And these are the earliest versions of the story that survive textually. So obviously the transmitted stories might be older, but they didn't survive in physical form. And their, their textual weaknesses are actually later. And I'm not gonna translate the whole text here, uh, but just a little bit of the kind of the the action scene. So it says, the king drew his bow and shot at the group of deer, accidentally hitting Shanzi. With a fainting voice, Shanzi cried out saying, with one arrow, you killed three persons. When the king heard the human voice, he dismounted and inquired what had happened. Shanzi answered, my parents are old and both of them are both of them are blind. If nobody takes care of them, they will certainly starve to death. Having said these words, he died. So this is the, and of course here's the Chinese version we saw earlier, so the story goes on. Um, well, the story itself doesn't go on, so it stops here. So there's no miracle, interestingly, which I think is really, um, Surprising. But then there's a little, like, shi yue, right? There's a little summary in, in verse uh, at the end. And I think it's very surprising that there's no miracle because most of these filial piety stories have a miracle at the end. So something happens, something um, like the, the, the parents regain their eyesight, as in the case of uh, Shun, for example. Uh, we, we, we're not going to talk about his story anymore, but there is that element there. Or, or, or something happens, uh, a miracle. But in the story of Shanzi, which has a very, very clear miracle in the Buddhist tradition, in this um, Chinese popular tradition, the miracle is, is left out. Which is very interesting because it influences how the story evolves later. Because it does um, evolve further. Something we see here also is the name changes. So uh, instead of using the character Shan, which means glance, blink, or flash, or wink, they start using a different character, which is also pronounced Shan, and kind of means the same thing, but it's a different character. And so there is this disconnect between the stories in the Buddhist tradition and in the, I don't want to use the word Confucian, like Confucian tradition, but let's say popular Chinese uh, tradition. And nevertheless, I don't think the similarity uh, was not apparent to anyone uh, at that time because 
they would have known the story from art depictions and if they come across uh, the, the same story in, a, in, this, in these um, secular texts, then they obviously would have seen the similarity. And then what happens later, and we're dealing, basically talking about the two, three centuries as we go on, what happens later is that Shanzi becomes Tanzi. So he's often uh, written with this character, which is really basically the same character as this one, but using a different radical, right? And it's, it, they were probably pronounced very similar at that time, but today they're pronounced completely differently. So one is Shanz, the other is Tan. And so he becomes this um, known as Tanzi. And Tanzi is, is interesting because there was a Tanzi in Chinese tradition. Uh, he was the Marquis of Tan. So the Zi there doesn't mean son. It's a noble rank. One of the four, five, five noble ranks in, um, in preaching China, in early China. And so he supposedly this person lived um, at the same time as Confucius and maybe even taught Confucius. And so because of that, he's often referred to as Zhou Tanzi, so Zhou referring to the Zhou period, but then it just becomes a surname. So suddenly we have this person like uh, Xing Zhou, right? So whose surname is Zhou and given name is Tanzi. And there's this um, gradual kind of uh, moving away from um, the original uh, Buddhist version of the story even in the name. And parallel with this, we also start having uh, depictions of the story in murals. And these depictions begin with the Song period. There's only one single copy, one single uh, example where the text, not text, where the image appears in a, during the five dynasties. So this, is, this would be somewhat earlier um, so probably the, I don't know, the first half of the 10th century. But, so this is identified by archeologists as the, as, as Tanzi. But I don't think it is because there's, there's nothing else. Here's another image from the same tomb. There's nothing that tells us that this is actually Tanzi. And even that this is a deer, it's not very clear. And also because of the date, five dynasties, um, I, I, I am inclined to think that this is, a, this, this is not the story of Shan or Tan, Tanzi. It's, it's a different, maybe not even a story, um, but we don't know because it's not very visible. But we do have the story and sometimes you have inscriptions that tell us that this is the story. And so this, this one, for example, it's, it's, the image is a little blurred, but I think it's visible. It's from a Song tomb from the late 11th century uh, from Huguan, uh, Huguan Xian in Shanxi, in Shanxi province. And we see this little boy uh, wearing almost like a costume, and that costume is obviously the deer skin, right? So he's wearing the deer skin. I don't know what he's doing with his hands there, probably drawing water um, it's, again, it's not very clear, but it's only him. So there's nothing else. We only know that it's him because of the context. So there are other filial sons there and with this costume of, a, of an animal skin, it, it has to be uh, Shanzi. But there's no king, so the king is irrelevant. The focus is on, on the boy, right? Because He's the hero in this story. He's the one who's so filial um, that he becomes a kind of, he, he triggers a miracle. Here's another version where we can see that he's holding something, maybe an arrow. Um, he wears, he, he's not only wearing a deer skin, but he's, he even has antlers, right? So he's, he's almost like he pretends to be a deer rather than kind of just wearing the deer skin as a, as a clothing. 
and the king um, is very martial, very military, comes on a horse, somebody leave, leading the horse. And this must be after uh, the king shot him because the arrow is in his hand. So these are all from tombs, right? And we know that these filial stories, they become a, a common element in tombs. In Chinese tombs from, say, the Song period onward, the Song and the Jin uh, dynasties. Here's yet another um, depiction of the story. And in this case, we have, finally, we have an inscription. And this inscription says, Tan zi wei mu si lu ru. Right? So it's not immediately obvious what it says, but probably something like Tan zi is trying to get or wants to get uh, doe milk, so deer milk. Uh, for his mother. And in the, at this time, or in later, from the Yuan Dynasty on, we have in the story this element of the dough milk, uh, because apparently that cures the blindness of his parents. So he's, he's after. This, is, this kind of explains why he's hanging out with the deer. What is he doing with the deer? Which, which is not very clear in the original Buddhist stories, or even in the Ramayana. Right? He, he just happens to be kind of like he's, a, he's on very good terms with all the animals. So that element here is completely gone. And there, uh, I think the stories are trying to create some kind of logical connection with this otherwise quite surprising uh, attire. Again, not immediately clear what the king is doing because of the uh, inscription, we know that this is the story of Tanzu. Uh, the king doesn't look like a king, he looks like a peasant. Uh, but it must be referring to the same um, thing in the story. And it's, it's almost like he's having, he has a lance or something um, and stabbing Shanzu rather than uh, shooting him with an arrow. So this is already from the Jin dynasty. Um, here's another one which is kind of very uh, indistinct. We don't know what's happening, but we can see that he's, uh, there, are there are several things that are important here. He's very small and he wears a deer skin, right? And the smallness, I think, is, is also important because it kind of signals his, um, that he's defenseless. He's very... Um, it's like a fight between the powerful and the, and the innocent. So it's, I think, probably referring to his innocence. And then here's another example. And this is, I only have one more example to show you, so uh, don't worry. Uh, this is a rubbing of this um, mural or engraving or relief in a Sung tomb. And here, quite interestingly, his name goes back to the Buddhist uh, example. But it doesn't seem to be a Buddhist story. It's still this mainstream Chinese popular story. Um, and the king, again, on, on a horseback. And Shanzi is already sitting here wearing his, uh, his costume. But he's identified. Uh, his identity is, is, is there. And then finally, I, I wanted to show you this example, which was at the front, at the poster, actually, for this talk. Also, this is um, for the, from a Yuan dynasty, uh, so the Mongol period uh, tomb. And it's quite interesting that the king is very dynamic, um, kind of befitting the Mongol period, horseback riding. But quite interesting that the figure of this, which is not very visible, but um, that figure underneath is, is really milking the dough, right? It's getting dough milk. Um, and there's an inscription which uh, actually explains that. The inscription says that um, he's giving, yeah, he's giving dough milk to his, presenting dough milk to his parent, uh, to his parents or parent, probably his mother. So. This story in the Chinese tradition continues, and with the Yuan 
So we see it here, but then it suddenly, I think, explodes and it becomes really, really mainstream. And it becomes one of the 24 uh, paragons of filial piety, the Arche Social, right? So he's, he's, the story is then everywhere. And it continues to this day. Um, although maybe in the last decades, it's, it's, there's less attention to these, but uh, this is an early 20th century uh, book, for example, about the Arche Social. And uh, we see the same story appearing here. And quite interestingly, actually, at this point, the story becomes kind of flat. There is, there is no tragedy. There is no miracle. It's almost like well, nothing really happens. And so that's why I think it's very interesting. Why would it be part of the Arche Social? But it's interesting that it, that it is because the king here does not kill him. The king here just kind of goes there, um, is almost to shoot him, and then Tanza says, oh, okay, stop, I'm a person, actually. And the king says, what, what's happening? Oh, I'm doing this and that. And basically, this, this uh, accident is stopped before it happens. And then he's collecting dough milk for his mother. So there are these elements, the caring is there, but the miracle element is no longer there. So here is a, uh, a translation of this. Obviously, it's quite, there's some mistakes, like instead of went, you have meant, and things like that. This is an early uh, 20th century version. So, and here he's described as Tanzu of the Zhou dynasty, right? So it's um, already completely changed from the original um, Buddhist version, which, which was the version with which it, it actually came to China. So if we look at this whole, um, the transmission of this story, I don't really want to build up kind of this chronological linear evolution of the story because that's not uh, what actually happened. But we see that there was the Ramayana story and this Ramayana story continues to this day um, in lots of countries uh, throughout uh, South Asia and Southeast Asia. So it's very, the Ramayana is very, very popular. And there are lots of, lots of depictions of it. But then the story in, in China sometime um, in the early medieval period, uh, the Buddhist story gets translated and images of the story within the Buddhist context start appearing. Um, in Western China, and also then they move into Central China. And this Buddhist um, version, again, continues. And it's not as popular today as before, but it, it is part of the Buddhist culture even today. So it didn't die out or something, but it's there. So these two versions go hand in hand. They're parallel, uh, perhaps happening in different parts of Asia. And then finally, we have this mainstream Confucian, Confucian version of the story, which again, leads on. And so that we have these three parallel channels. And obviously, there are many, many subdivisions between these main channels, which are just continue to this day. So this is kind of an interesting case where something that began with, um, in a particular tradition, kind of went or changed in a different tradition to something, then changed again, and it just continues to evolve or continues to be used. And uh, the same person is actually revered uh, in different traditions until uh, to this very day. So basically, this is what I um, wanted to talk about today, mainly, to show, I mean, to me, it's actually, it's very exciting how um, something like this can remain, even the earliest, something that's more than 2,000 years old, even that earliest version uh, continues in some form today. And later versions, they also continue. So thank you very much. And I hope to listen to your comments or questions. Thank you.
Yes? Am I naming people? <laughs> OK. Yes, Professor Guang. Uh, it's quite interesting. You trace back to the Ramayana, which is a story. I didn't know about that. <laughs> so what's the background for that story? Because the Buddhists, of course, are mainly emphasizing on the filial piety. Uh, what's the, I mean, Ramayana, what do they do for their story? Well, I'm, I'm not a, uh, probably not the right person to talk about the Ramayana, but it's, a, it's an epic, right? And it's, it follows, uh, it's the story of Rama, uh, or Ram, I don't know. And uh, it actually, in reality, it's a collection of stories. And uh, to be honest, the story, this story of like shooting an elephant and hitting a boy is not only in the Ramayana. So there are other early Indian texts that also have it. So this must be from before that. But the version we have in the Ramayana, uh, in terms of its background, it's not about the boy. That's the interesting thing. So the boy, it's not about the boy caring for his parents. Uh, that's, that's a minor motif in it. The, the point is that the king gets a curse. So this, this part of the Ramayana, which talks about King Dasharatha, is, is focused on the king, right? It tells the king's story. And so we learn what happened to him. So it's almost like this is how he got cursed, and that's it. So um, there's really no focus and no, no commiseration with the, or no sympathy for the boy in the story. Um, it's not his filial, I guess he's filial, because he's taking care of his parents. But again, the king doesn't necessarily feel very sorry for that. It's, it just, I mean, he does in the story, but that's not the main point of, of that version. Mm. So, so that means the, when the Buddhists are taking up the story, so the emphasizing totally changed, changing into a filial story, you emphasize the filial part because of Buddhist. Yeah, I think in the, and this, is, this is probably not that the Buddhists looked around and looked for compatible stories, but there was a, some sort of transformation and there were many, many different versions. But what happens eventually is that, yes, the story is flipped around and it's from the perspective of the boy now that we have the story. And he becomes the main hero in it. And then he's, he's resurrection, so he comes back to life. So it's a real miracle. In the, actually in the Ramayana, I think he, um, or some early Indian versions, he, he's also resurrected, or he's, he, no, not resurrected, he goes up to heaven or something. So there is, there is an element of, of, uh, of a miracle there. Yeah. But, so the, the main change in the Buddhist version, I think, is that it's the same story told from a different perspective, and then it, of course, signifies something completely different. Yeah, it's a, uh, it's a Buddha's past life, <laughs> Jataka story, yes, yes. become a Janta story. So the boy becomes the Buddha's past life, <laughs> so something totally changed. Yes, so he yeah. becomes, yeah, he's the, he's the Bodhisattva, basically, Bodhisattva, yeah. at, that, at that point, yes. Yeah. And that's why in the, say, the Mahavastu version, um, he is transforming the forest around him, right? Mm. Again, that's something we haven't seen in the Ramayana version. So he's suddenly, like, wherever he walks, things become beautiful and nice and pleasant. Yeah. 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 Because it's also a focus on him. Quite interesting. Thank you so much. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. Yeah, Ulrike. Yeah, thank you so much for, for sharing this, the, all these, uh, this whole range of, of illustrations of the story. I found them really interesting. Um, I was curious about the location where these scenes are depicted. And obviously, you have the, Chama, the Buddhist Jataka in a Buddhist cave because it's part of the stories of self-sacrifice of the Bodhisattva, feeding himself to a tigress or letting himself be shot, etc. So that kind of is obvious to me. What I don't know, um, why do you have stories of filial piety in tombs? Because if you have a tomb for your ancestors, for your parents, wouldn't you rather expect a scene where the parents are glorified rather than their offspring? Isn't it saying, look at us, how pious we are? Isn't that a strange thing to do? Well, maybe, but 
that's definitely the custom. So there is uh, these stories of filial piety uh, are in tombs from uh, quite early, from before the Tang period, um, and they're sometimes they're quite elaborate. So they can be carved into stone and uh, kind of go around uh, the coffin. So th yes, there, it's it's. It's it's a it's a tradition that that begins very early, and it has to do it's it it, it has to do something with uh, reverence for parents, right? So it's maybe not they're not saying that we are like them, but somehow this motif that we have to do something like this is like we take these stories um, seriously or some something mm. like that maybe. Is it reassuring the parents that they are taken care of? We take good care of you. Yeah, I, I'm not sure, <laughs> but this is a this is a funerary uh, tradition in China, uh, quite early. Yeah. Je further generations. This is an example. Further generations. Example to further generations. Yeah. So example for further generation. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yes. Uh, with regards to the popularity of the story, is there any evidence to suggest that it was um, prom actively promoted by the ruling class or by the commoner? Um, you mentioned the tombs. Were these um, tombs of the, the nobles or the ruling class, or these are common people's tombs? So I'm just curious, you know, which angle that the story was being promoted? Well, so these tombs from the Song Dynasty onward, uh, I think many of them are just uh, probably ordinary people. And so that's why you may see that the, the king looks very unkingly in, in some of the images. He just wears kind of a very simple clo clothes. Um, yeah, so I don't think it's necessarily the, or definitely not just the ruling class. Um, but having said that, uh, we noticed, I worked with a, a colleague on this, uh, for a while, and we noticed that it's actually quite apparent that in some versions there's, there's a lot of effort to explain in the textual versions to explain that the king is not to be blamed. And he said, isn't that convenient? Because like, from the ruler's perspective, uh, this was something, because otherwise it's a Jataka story, right? So you kind of respect the story as it is, but it's always a problem that if you're a king, like, oh, the king is the one who's killing the boy. Uh, but as I said, quite, in quite a few cases, there is, uh, there's not one or two sentences, but quite a few sentences explaining, like, oh, no, no, the king is not to be blamed. This, this was a karmic thing. This was meant to be happening. Thank you very much, Professor. Um, could you uh, explain a little bit more why it was so important for, you said you didn't want to use the word Confucian, but the, why it was so important for the Chinese story to distinguish itself uh, from the Buddhist story? Because uh, my sort of uh, understanding was that there's a relatively harmonious coexistence between the Buddhists and yeah, Confucians. Yeah, I don't, I don't think it was important to distinguish itself. So, because there's some ideas uh, that maybe they distinguish them, they, they hid the identity of Shanza. They wanted to kind of conceal the origin, the Buddhist of the origin of the story. But I don't believe that. As I said, I think it's quite recognizable if you live in this culture. Uh, but rather, I think it was, it kind of got distanced uh, over time, perhaps by being used in a different context. So it, I don't think it was a important thing to do. It's rather maybe just something that happened, um, you know. It was not an intentional breakaway. Yeah. There was some similarity between this Buddhist story that um, that is little child um, sucks the milk from a doe, and in the Roman legend. I think. Oh uh, yeah. Yeah, they they also suck milk from from Romulus and yeah. Remus. Yeah. I, I wonder why 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 there is similarity similarity between the two, and another thing is 
Now, in, in the case of uh, the Romans, they have wolves. In the case of Buddhism, they have deer. I'm not too familiar with Buddhism, honestly. Does the deer represent anything in Buddhism? Well, I mean, the deer is very common in, in Buddhist stories, right? So think of the story of Liu Saka, who is, who is shooting deer, and then he goes to hell for that. And so I don't know what, if there is any symbolic significance to the deer. Maybe. Um, in this case, wearing a deer skin, I think it implies also maybe innocence. Uh, or something like that, and also that he's part of the forest, um, so he's 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 part of it. He's not an outsider, uh, like the king, for example. Um, so they that's an I interesting element because they merge. That's why they the forest is kind of uh, uh, displaying the symptoms of whatever is happening with them. And what was the first part of your question? Is, uh, not real, I, I saw the similarity between oh yeah, yeah, the, yeah. The story of Romulus and Remus. Yeah, it would be very irresponsible of me to connect the two without any evidence. But I think there there might be some kind of uh, West Asian parallels to the Roman story, which I haven't looked at it. And of course there. There are Chinese parallels to that, right? The the, the Xiongnu and stuff, where they, um, one of the princesses, she uh, she marries a, a wolf and all their offsprings. So there there are all these nomadic elements in that. But I'm not sure what the the Roman story is. Uh, on the other hand, this the Buddhist stories in, in the Mahavastu, I think has a has a modern parallel in the story, the Jungle Book. Uh, which was written by Kipling, who lived in India, right? And I think he probably, because it's very, he goes on for a long time describing how he's playing with all the, all the animals. And I think Kipling might have been uh, influenced by these stories, which would have been part of the uh, the local uh, folklore, I think. Thank you. Yes. And in Jungle Book, uh, the boy is dark in color, I think. There is in the Chinese story, they become Chinese. Also dark. <laughs> yes. So in the in the Jungle Book, he's also dark. In the Indian versions, he's dark color. His name is dark, also. But in in China, he, well, he becomes uh, more like a Chinese boy. Yeah. Just like other, which is common in like if you see Christian images, then Jesus and Mary, they also become Chinese um, in the Ming Dynasty and Qing Dynasty. I mean. Uh, Pictorial, in pictorial representation. So I think that's a kind of a normal um, development. When and the images of the same story, similar stories, changed or was modified from cave to cave along the Silver, I think. Yes. yes, but I think what we see today is, is only a small part of what there was, right? So it's very hard to connect things, and we shouldn't connect things in this direct linear matter, manner, but uh, we should see these as kind of remnants of something that was, that was not linear, but was like a whole thing happening. Like there would have been many, many depictions and many stories and the story would have been told orally, uh, maybe studied in school and written down. All, there are all these things, manifestations of it, which we don't have access to anymore. Yeah, thank you. Yes, Bill. Thank you for the talk. I, I found it fascinating that the three versions, the South Asian version and the Buddhist version and the Chinese versions, despite the, the linearity in, in terms of how they evolved from, um, from the, the, the source, they, they were actually uh, they are still current. Exactly, yeah. Um, my question uh, is the transition between the, the, the Buddhist, the, the uh, to uh, Zhou Tanzi. So you mentioned the um, Dunhua. I don't know the, the passage um, from the Dunhua manuscript. Is it from the Bianwen or is it? No, uh, no, this is a, uh, well, it doesn't have a title, and modern scholars call it the Xiaozi Zhuan, which it is not, because it doesn't have that title. 
but it's just a collection of stories of the Siodza stories, so filial, son stories. There are five or six manuscripts, and they're in different order. So it's, it's a question whether they're actually one text or not, because the order is different of these stories. So it, it's just a, where is it? So it was still, um, it was composed as a, 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 a Banshan is the Jataka story. No, this is a, a secular story. Oh, this is secular already. This is secular story, yes, in Tunhuang. Well, I'm asking because the 24, the Er Shi Xiao, is uh, usually we associate with the Yuan version, but it actually the earliest version goes back to the Dunhuang. This oh, yeah, actually there, Er Shi Xiao. There are actually versions of the Er Shi Xiao, right? In, yes, in Dunhuang. Yeah. So a I poem, poem about them and something. Dunhuang, yes, yeah. I, I have not studied it, so I wonder if you, you you know anything. Is that is is that Dunhuang Er Shi Xiao actually the the source of the I don't think it's the always one. the same Arsha Sushiao, right? So they're different. Uh, maybe the name Arsha Sushiao comes from, at least from the, the Song period or maybe, or maybe the Wudai uh, period. But uh, the actual identity of each of the 24 sons is not always the same. But actually, we have a new book on these uh, in <laughs> Professor Guang's book, so he probably goes into detail about that too. Yeah. Thank you. And there is, of course, the, 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 the book of Keith Knapp, um, uh, American scholar who, who has a whole book on, called Filial Offsprings on these, um, the Chinese, only the Chinese secular. And of course, we use the word secular is not, not right here because it is kind of a religious devotion to your parents. So, but it's not the Buddhist. It's the, the Chinese popular kind of tradition. Sorry, you, you were. Yeah. I mean, I didn't talk about it. Okay, okay. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, uh, what you have said, this earliest is the 10th century. Um, that's just a comment. I think is that with the Buddhist, because of the Fumo and Zhongjian became very popular in the Han Dynasty, and Fumo and Zhongjian actually replaced the story of uh, Sama Jataka. And the Sama Jataka, of course, became so popular that. So the ordinary people took up it and developed it into, uh, you can say, Confucian or non-Confucian stories. Well, the Buddhist, you know, continued with another story. Yeah, yeah. And, uh, so that's why after the like tenth century onwards, or during the Tang Dynasty, the Buddhist concentrating on the Fumu and Zhongjin yeah. and much more popular. Well, the Sama Jataka become a Chinese story or something. Yes. Yes. So the past, you know, separate, separate paths. Separate yeah. yeah. And these, these stories of the filial sons, they're actually very popular in other countries like Korea especially, and of course in Japan, but mainly Korea where you have their own stories or, or you have stories of like the Korean Goju. Somebody inspired by the story of Goju buries his own son and also finds gold and, and things like that. So there, there are quite, um, quite a lot of different variations of these. This becomes a very, very large and, and, and massive phenomenon in, throughout East Asia. And not only East Asia, also in Central Asia. And actually some of the stories travel further. So they, they reach Europe. Like, um, I don't know, in Transylvania you have a story which matches one of the filial piety stories. Like there is this um, story of, I forgot the name probably, uh, Professor Guang will know, is this story of a, um, of a son and a grandson taking grandpa out into the forest, right, on a, on a sled, pulling him there and leaving him there to kind of, this is the Chila tradition, to discard the old. And then they, the, the grandson brings back the sled, pulls back, and then the father says, why are you bringing this? This is such bad omen for us. And he said, well, when you die or when you become old, I'll take you on this sled to where we left grandpa. And then the father kind of like reflects and then, okay. And then they go back and, and fetch grandpa. So this story is, is uh, I've seen this story in collections of like Siberian, f Russian folk tales, also in Hungarian folk tales from, uh, from Transylvania.
So it, it is, I've even seen a early 20th century uh, modern Uyghur version in Xinjiang. It was, it was printed by um, the Reverend Hunter uh, who, was, who was working there. So it's, it's, it enters different languages and it becomes very, very popular. Yeah. But I think the Chinese one, which is, I'm not sure, I think it's from the Han Shu or somewhere, so it's, the Chinese one is probably the earliest. Uh, the story can go back to Yindi, <laughs> what you said, that story. There is, uh, in that collection, the same, say, similar stories, Qi Lao Zhu. Yeah. Uh, it's uh, the India story. Perhaps the India story transmitted to China, perhaps. <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And this whole Qi Lao tradition to discard the old people, it, again, it has a, this very becomes a very important tradition in Japan. So there are many, many stories about them there. Yeah, the Kiro tradition. This is the opportunity to ask a question. <laughs> yes. Uh, for us to learn uh, something new about uh, uh, Shanzi, the story of Shanzi. I'm very interested to know, uh, did you identify uh, which text is more relevant to the Gandhara sculpture relief? No, no, I, I didn't actually even uh -huh. work on the Gandhara sculpture. So uh -huh. my interest was, when I began writing on this, my interest was mainly kind of the well, this manuscript <laughs> from Dunhuang, <laughs> from Dunhuang. And I wanted to uh -huh. see how it transformed, how it became this story, uh -huh. right? why it lost the ending, for uh -huh. example. But then, as I was writing, I had to look at more and more other versions. Right? Mm -hmm. During so the peer review process, people <laughs> wanted me to dig deeper into the Indian connection, yeah. which I, I didn't want to because that uh -huh. was not my focus, but I did, and I found lots of lots of Mm. Other things which should be written up mm -hmm. as a different paper, probably. Yeah. But yeah. Because we know uh, during the early period there are several different versions of the text. Yes. That were translated uh, into Chinese. Yeah. Uh, so which uh, text that uh, that that is more relevant to the cave to to nine nine in the northern Zhou? Yeah, well, yeah, and also the Gandhara relief. This one, yeah. yeah. Because there are a, a lot of uh, detail in the relief. No, it is possible to uh, kind of to study it, but uh -huh. I don't think it matches any of the text mm. exactly. Yeah. Uh -huh. Like even the Dunhuang ones don't yeah. match uh -huh. the extant version. So they, as I said, we. We only have the Chinese version, yeah. so some Chinese versions, uh -huh. some very few of the Indian versions, like the Mahavastu, for example, which yeah. is actually already kind of late, mm -hmm. the second, fourth century. Mm. Um, so the Gandharan one was obviously not based on the Chinese version, so on something oh. else, oh. and uh, we don't have that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay, thank you. But what, what it tells us actually is that it was a very varied tradition, and it was very common. So there would have been lots of lots of different versions of the story. Yeah, yeah. yeah it's not so. one main, you know. Because yeah. once you have like something like the canon or something, mm -hmm. then then those few versions become very commonly known, mm -hmm. and they don't change as much. But before that, the, there was all sorts of different changes. Also in the Arsha Sishyal, before they become canonized, mm -hmm. uh, become kind of a one set, mm -hmm. fixed set, then mm -hmm. there's lots of changes. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. I have a quick question about the term filial piety. Uh, of course, in Chinese is Xiao, and um, in the, the Brazilian text it is always like that, Xiao. Uh, in your uh, comparative studies across the different languages, uh, is this word expressed in um, other texts? Um, I'm now working on, for example, the Ashtasastrika Prajapalamita. I, I was looking at the chapter 13, and they talk about how the, the children uh, would 
uh, help a sick mother, and and this is the way we should uh, care about Raja Paramita. But in this long passage, that I I never came across anything that is comparable to the Chinese word. Yeah, Xiao. I don't. I think in languages derivative from Chinese. So when it gets translated from Chinese into other things, then they might use the word like later, like Mongolian and and something. But before that, I, I don't know either. Like, I haven't come across anything. But, for example, the um, scholars have been thinking that, for example, the Liu Tu Ti Jing and these things, these, these interesting stories about filial piety are maybe also triggered by this Chinese interest in Xiao, right? So that's why they choose these stories, um, which is a possibility. And then they, in the stories, they, they use the word xiao. So somebody was like, zhi xiao, like very, very filial and something. But that, we don't know what the original was. So it's, it might have been something completely different. It, it might have been something, he really loved his parents, right? And then it gets translated into Chinese because by that time in China, there's this interest in this concept. The, the case of the Indian, the Shravana, in the, yeah. in the Ramayana, and, and that little picture book uh, saying beautiful sun or something like that. So maybe... Um, this one? Uh, yes, yes, the, the virtues and values and yeah, yeah. Shravana Kumar. Yeah, so I here, I don't know in, in Hindi what they use. I mean, you would be the right person to look at it. Oh, in Tamil. You're learning Tamil, so you, you should... But the, uh, you know, Nakamura, Nakamura said in Yimbi and the Sanskrit language, there is no such a word as Xiao, he said okay. in his book. Oh. <laughs> it's called the... the so probably of, no, no such word, yeah. Xiao. No yeah. such kind of word. But of course, the filial practice should be there. The yeah, of course, in, in China, Xiao is, a, is an interesting term because it has early precedents, right? Quite, quite early, going back to the warring states and even earlier. And so these later in the early or in the Han period or in, and after the Han, they start to be used for these children. And I, I actually think these are different traditions. So like the Xiao Jing doesn't talk about these, these, anything like this, right? It just emphasizes how important that is. So I think they're, we're dealing, like it's very easy to connect this from early China to medieval China because of the word xiao and this whole concept. But I think there are different traditions. So once the Indian influence comes in, then I think that's when this uh, interest in filial sons uh, develop in China. I'm not sure if I'm correct in this, but. <laughs> Just related to this, I ever read an article um, uh, saying that actually in the early Sangha of China use the story to defend the critics on them because the Buddhism actually required people to leave their home so that they can't support their family in home so that, that that's a critic from the society at the early um, you know when the Buddhism first come to China um, did you find a similar thing in, uh, in your study I, I didn't look at these but I can see how it's it's, it's very relevant, yeah, in, in such debates where they're always talking about, yeah, the chu jia and these things where you leave your family. Because there, there are debates later, right? And where this concept always comes up and gets criticized. And so, yeah, we're shaving your head or whatever. Yeah, so it's, it's a good, there's actually quite a, well, this book <laughs> talks yeah. about my coming from uh, Professor Guangxi. <laughs> yeah, I, I, yeah, yeah. It's, right. This book talks about those overlaps. Uh, yeah. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor, uh, for your presentation. Uh, this presentation can really reflect a phenomenon that uh, maybe Chinese people know why they emphasize on the truth of history, uh, because the. Uh, Hansi in history is a Confucius teacher. Uh, is a teacher of Confucius, but uh, it's a, a story actually from India. So, so, so maybe the, uh, the, this is a, a very uh, obvious phenomenon that uh, Western people and the Chinese people to see the history is very different. 
Based, uh, based on people may more uh, emphasize on the truth of history, but Chinese people may emphasize on the purpose or the meaning of the history. They don't want uh, very care of the truth. Uh, so, so, so that is many stories like this. Maybe no uh, original from China. So, uh, let's, my question is that uh, uh, for contemporary Buddhist studies, it's also may, uh, mainly focused on the truth or details of the scriptural history. But uh, for uh, a traditional uh, Buddhist uh, teachings, more emphasize on the purpose or meanings of the history, no very emphasis on truth. So, uh, so what's your opinion about uh, uh, contemporary academic uh, study and uh, traditional uh, Buddhist but you think that they can, can temporary or that can uh, benefit each other or? Yeah, I, d I don't have a good answer to that. I think it's a matter of perspective, and of course these perspectives change over time, right? So what, what was important 20 years ago is less important today. And um, these different um, ideas about the development of civilizations 50 years ago are completely rewritten today, and now we have other, other points of view. So that's really kind of a modern, well, um, yeah, the, the question of modern research approach, approaches in scholarship, how you do that. I mean, my own, my own approach in this one was really just trying to follow the threads. <laughs> it was very simple um, just to kind of find something and it's like, oh, okay, let me, let me find out what's happening here and then go further. So I was not looking for the truth uh, or the motivation even. Um, just just trying following the evidence. Of course, I'm interpreting it in some way, but but that's kind of uh, my approach. Probably comes from outsides. I mean, I'm I'm very interested in the multilingual and multicultural exchanges uh, over well Central Asia and also towards China, maybe further. Um, but I think that's not the wrong approach here. I think that's a good approach in, in something that's actually happening in this uh, area. Yeah. So I don't really have a, like a very clear opinion on which one is better or what, whether they can coexist or not. Actually, lots of different approaches can coexist. That, yeah. Yes, please. Um, thank you very much for this fa very fascinating presentation. Um, I really learned a lot from your presentation. Um, just a follow-up question with the um, gentleman. When this story um, came to China and then the, the person originally Sanzi and then in the Chinese version it attributed to Tanzi, do you think it is um, um, something, um, uh, I mean, the people doing with a purpose so that give some authority that, okay, this story is really from the Confucius um, perspective, or it's just a, a beautiful misunderstanding? Yeah, I, I, I don't really think it's a misunderstanding. I think it's, yeah, maybe giving authority to the, um, the story, but again, I think they're not really trying to deceive anyone. So this, these, these changes would have been fairly obvious, and maybe there is no contradiction. So it was not like, oh, if we change it to Zhou Tanzi, then, then what's going to happen? Like, then it doesn't fit anymore. Because I think people were more relaxed in, uh, with these categories. And, and also, there would have been lots of different versions, I think. So when uh, you mentioned that this story came to China, like, yes, this story came to China, but rather we should maybe say this story has been coming to China, right? 
So it would have come in like dozens or maybe hundreds of different versions, most of which are lost. And uh, the images also come to China, probably separately, um, in a different way. So yeah, it's not like Shanzi gets introduced to China and then everybody knows about Shanzi, but rather it's a gradual process of introducing it, over, introducing again, and not always, not all Buddhist texts use the same character or transcribe his name like that, right? Like Xuanzang, for example, he, he used the word, what was like, uh, Shang Mo uh, Jia or something, I think. So he used, he tried to transcribe it because Xuanzang's point was always to be more accurate, right? He was dissatisfied with previous translations and he's, he, he was trying to make a point there. So. Um, in that case, it was a different character. So he's talking about uh, Shanzi uh, or Shyama is actually another point of introducing it, him uh, to the Chinese tradition. Because in, in the Tatang Xi Yuji, he actually talks about the place where he says, oh, this is where the Bodhisattva lived because he passed that cave and he said, or not that cave, that city, and he says, well, outside there is the cave where the Bodhisattva, this uh, Shan Modya, lived uh, with his parents. Yeah, so I think it's important to kind of think in these terms. Like I always try to tell my students not to kind of think in linear terms, right? To like whatever gets introduced, it gets, it keeps coming, right? It's not endlessly coming, but it's not only coming this way; it's coming the other way and, and all other directions. That's why we have different traditions and here we only looked at three main traditions but each of those main traditions would have hundreds of minor variations maybe thousands of them and we know like india how complex it is culturally today right so each language each group would probably have their own versions of this story yeah. thank you Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, so in the presentation, you provided some uh, pictures of uh, the way this story was rendered at different places. And I was just wondering whether, and you've also made interesting comments about the fact that the textual transmission of this story might be uh, somewhat different to the visual transmission of this story. And um, I was wondering in your work where, whether your focus is mainly on the textual transmission. You provided those images tonight just for some context or whether in fact your work is also looking at the um, synergy between those two lines of tra tradition. Yeah, well, because of my training, I probably focus on on texts and languages, and then I'm always prompted by colleagues to look up images and stuff. And for the presentation, obviously, I didn't want to give you <laughs> parallel tables of, of, of different languages and different versions, so uh, I chose the images, yeah. But my, I'm not an art historian, so I'm a textual scholar, and I uh, focus on the, on the text. But I do recognize how important the images are, obviously. Uh, but then you sort of said, it, is that your, is your sort of hypothesis that the, perhaps the visual tradition might have been more uh, powerful in transmitting this story, or, or that was just sort of a throwaway remark? No, it's not a hypothesis, and I probably didn't say it was more powerful, my, or maybe I said that, but my point would, would have been is that there was another parallel transmission of images, so same story could have come as text, as images, in different versions. Um, each of them in many different versions, and probably other versions like, say, um, orally, yeah. Um, professor, uh, just looking at this slide, I'm just curious about, you know, the transition from the character Shan, Shanzi to Tanzi, Tan. You know, when, when did that exactly happen? Because I noticed, you know, Shan, the radical is the I, Whereas time, the radical is the year. So as you know, the earlier, in the earlier version, um, Shanz was caring for his blind parents. So perhaps the I was quite important in his name. But then later on in the Chinese version or the, you know, the secular version, you know, the, the importance of the blind parents seemed to be you know, diminished. So 
and then maybe perhaps the ear function becomes more prominent. So I wonder if that had anything to do with the transition of the, the you know, difference uh, in the characters. You mean this one on the right? Yeah. The ear? Yeah. That's not an ear. Uh, it's, right? it's like a city. Is this? Uh, yeah. It's the E, like a city. Okay. Um, so, Ardoban. Ardoban. Yeah, but it's only called that, right? Okay. Because it kind of looks like today, like an ear, but actually it's not, it's not an ear. Okay. Um, it's, it, it's added to place names. Mm. And so if you look up Tan in the dictionary, it doesn't have any meaning. It means a city somewhere in Shantung. Um, okay. it's, a, it's a region, and also it can be a, a surname, okay. probably deriving from the city. Okay. So, OK, what, uh, I, I do think that originally the, the, the I radical is important. Uh, because he's taking care of his, I mean, because of the significance of his parents' uh, eyesight. But then I think later that kind of is still there, right? Because he's, he's getting dough milk for his mother's, to cure his mother's eye. To, um, so maybe it's still there. I don't know. Maybe not as dramatically, you're right. So mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's more kind of pedestrian, that kind <laughs> of care. Um, but you said, you asked, like, when did this exactly happen? Mm. Well, it didn't happen exactly, right? It happened over a long period, and we have, like, I showed this one example, this one here. So this is from a Song Dynasty tomb, and the character used there is, is the I. Mm. Uh, the radical is the I radical. So by this, and this is the secular story, so by this time, it was mostly written with the, with the ear radical, the ear radical, mm -hmm. but occasionally it was also written like this. And it goes, actually, even in Buddhist texts, mm -hmm. uh, you can find examples where the name is written like this. Mm -hmm. It's more like a, uh, it's more like a preference, like numbers. So there's 90% that way and 10% this way. So this is not a, like an immediate thing, uh, but kind of evolved and yeah. Okay. And then if at one point somebody probably thought like Zhou Tan is a, is, a, is a good, yeah, the teacher of Confucius. Yeah. Sounds more Chinese. It sounds very Chinese and sounds um, very serious, very important, yeah. <laughs> Rather than a boy who gets shot, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. But actually, in the Buddhist text, he's not just a boy, he's the Bodhisattva, right? So he's actually an important person. I think time is up, and also there's no questions. Huh? Uh, thank you so much. At the end, I invite. Um, Professor Hakias, the director of the Center of Buddhist Studies, to present you a gift. Oh, thank you. 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 Thank you so much for well, the interesting you. and thought-provoking stories. <laughs> thank you. Thank you.